we pray things like, Lord, bless me financially. Anybody ever prayed that prayer? Did you pray that prayer without realizing that part of God's plan for being blessed financially includes tithing and giving? <laughs> it's like, Lord, I don't want to tithe. I don't want to give 10% of my income. Lord, I, I'll stay broke all the time if I do that. But I really want you to bless me financially. Well, the two are tied together. You can't have one without the other. So when we begin to pray for God's will in our life and God's plan in our life, we have to expect that there's going to be some things that don't line up with what we wanted whenever we begin to ask for that. It's like, God, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to go to church. I'm sorry, but I don't know any way to make that happen. If you disconnect those two, if you don't have a relationship with Almighty God, I, I don't know how you get to heaven. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. I, I don't know any other way to make that happen. We pray things like, Lord, make me a vessel that you can use. Without ever thinking about that story about the potter and the clay. Think about that story. I mean, he, he takes that clay, that, that vessel that was in pretty good shape, you know, and, and, and it's, on the, it's already on the wheel and it's already a vessel. And God comes along and says, well, I'm going to make that vessel a vessel that I can use. And he just rips the whole thing up and wads it up and starts working on it. Have you ever saw somebody work with clay? They, they have to really put that stuff through the ringer. I, I had a, not that I'm an artist, if I drew a picture of a dog, you wouldn't know if it's a dog or a duck or a horse. I, I'm terrible at that. But I took art class in school because it was an easy course. And one of the things that fascinated me was the, the older classes, the junior and senior classes, got to work with pottery. And they were making, uh, I don't know if anybody remembers, it's about 100 years ago, out in front of York High School, there used to be two big dragon heads that set up on top of some big pillars. And they made those dragon heads in class the year that I was there. And I didn't get to see them do it, but I got to see the process every day. And the first thing they did, they went out and dug up some clay. Well, if I'm nice and comfortable in my comfort zone, I don't want to be dug up. But before God can turn me into what he wants to turn me into, there's got to be some digging going on. So they went out and dug up some clay. They brought that clay in there and they began to mix it. They, they'd take their hands and force that clay. There was two different colors of it. There was a, a real white looking clay and a gray looking clay. And they had to blend that all together. And, and that part I didn't get to see. And they would just be there for, for hours and hours because it went on for day after day after day. They would work that clay until they got it all mixed together. Pressing it. Y'all ever play with Play-Doh? You got to put some pressure on that stuff. I don't mind telling you, I don't like it when God starts putting pressure on me and pushing me and changing me into something. You know, God, I know I prayed that prayer, but that ain't what I had in mind. That, that, Lord, I didn't want to go through all this stuff. Well, it happens. And God has to change us. And, and then one of the things that I just thought was fascinating never occurred to me, there was impurities in that clay. There was little bitty gravels and little bitty pieces of sand in that clay and they took all that clay that they had, hundreds of pounds of it, and forced it through a real fine screen. And I thought, boy, that, that's not a pleasant process at all when God starts putting you through that process that starts getting the impurities out. You think, well, wait a minute, I don't have any impurities, I got saved. Not quite. You are as perfect the minute you got up from that altar, the minute you said, Lord, come into my heart and be Lord of my life, you were as perfect right then as you're ever going to be. The problem is we got up and walked away from the altar and there's still things that are in our heart and in our life that we didn't leave right there, that we still hadn't got out. I was around 30-something years old. I smoked a pack and a half a day. Oh, here he goes. He's going to start preaching on all that stuff. No, I ain't preaching on all that stuff. I'm just telling you that in my life, there was a night that I was praying, and I was praying for some stuff, and I said, God, this is something I want. This is something I got to have. Lord, I want this in my life. Lord, I can't be who you want me to be unless I have this anointing, this, this, this 
God's presence in my life like I, like I, I want it and I desire it. And right in the middle of that, God spoke to my heart and said, you have something I want. And guess what he put his finger on? One of the things that I love the most. And I reached over there and I slid them off the table and I slid them into the trash can. Brand new packs that I just bought. And then I know it had to be God to cause it to happen, but Phyllis got up early the next morning and emptied the trash. <laughs> Wasn't nothing in there but my packs, two packs of cigarettes that I had there. God knows what he wants to do in our lives, and he will even take things, maybe that's, that something that's not even wrong, just something that maybe you spend more time watching TV than he wants you to, and he wants you to devote more time to prayer. He may put his finger on that, shine that spotlight, and say, right there's something I want out of your life. For you, that's an imperfection. Well, you mean somebody else could do it? Yeah. Unless God speaks to them. I happen to know that this lady right here spends hours a week in prayer. I happen to know there's other Christians that spend less time than that in prayer. Well, one of them's got to be wrong, right? No. Because God's placed her where he's placed her, and he's placed somebody else where he's placed them. And, and God works on us, and each one of us are individuals, and he's constantly growing us into what he wants us to be. Well, surely we're all going to be the same thing and all go to the same place. Not necessarily. God called me to preach. He may or may not call you to preach. God called pastor to pastor. He hadn't called me to pastor. I get to have all the fun of going out and running around. I, I told somebody earlier, I got to park tonight in the pastor's parking place. Pull my truck up there, pulled it right up to that sign that said pastor. Pastor. A few minutes later, I was in here and I thought, okay, if somebody comes in here tonight and they got some kind of real big problems or real big complaints, I'm going to move my truck. <laughs> let, let, let pastor deal with that whenever he gets back. Because there's, there's gifts that God gives pastors to do that job that's just above and beyond. Things that make me pull my hair out. In fact, whenever I was called to preach, my pastor asked me, he said, are you going to pastor a church? And I said, no, that's not in my heart. What's in my heart is to go to churches and encourage them and, and then come back to my home church. That's what's in my heart. He looked at me and he said, I would be the most miserable person in the world if I felt like I had to face a different congregation every Sunday morning. I said, I'd be the most miserable person in the world if I thought I had to face the same congregation every Sunday morning. Why? Because God puts the gifts inside of us and the desires in our heart inside of us all based on what he's got planned for us in our life. So when we find ourselves like the children of Israel, when we start saying, God, I, I need this in my life, he's going to do what it is we need in our life but it may not be the results that we thought were going to happen. I am fairly certain none of them, none of them were calling the U-Haul truck whenever they first began to pray for God to deliver them from, from the oppression that they were in. Lord, I promise I will be faithful. But Lord, it's so far to church. Lord, it's really raining out there tonight. I, do I have to go tonight? Or my personal favorite, Lord, it's really cold this morning. I don't mind the rain in the distance so far as I do the real, real bad cold. Interesting thing that I had never seen before, I began to look at what God put in my heart for this week. Whenever there's a situation that specifically deals with bondage, this, was, this is just something that I haven't studied it all out and read everything in the Bible about it. But whenever there's a situation like the children of Israel were in that specifically deals with bondage and hardship because of that bondage, whenever God gets involved in it, there's always a move that goes along with it. 
You ever think about that? Lord, deliver me from this situation. Because what we would like to pray sometimes is, Lord, I pray that you'd bless me in my situation, but don't make me move. Everybody here like me, I, I like my chair in my living room, right in front of the TV, not to be moved whenever I come home. Phyllis used to have a whole lot more energy than she's got now. And I would come home and the whole living room would be turned around. TV was on that side of the house when I left this morning, and it's on this side of the house now. My chair would be moved somewhere else, and I couldn't any longer take my glass of iced tea and just absent-mindedly set it right there. Had to set it over here. There's something interesting about change. I watch young people... They cannot wait for the newest iPhone to come out. That new iPhone comes out, I just look at it and say, my goodness, that thing is $900. They don't care. It's new. It's something new. I don't know what age it is, but there's some age that there's a line that we cross that all of a sudden new doesn't matter so much anymore. That new thing that just came out, Oh, I gotta have one. In fact, no, Phyllis got a text just as we pulled in the driveway. She said, oh, they're gonna give me a free iPhone 13. We will read the fine print. If they're gonna give her a new one, we'll get a new one. That, 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 that's okay, I still like new stuff. But there's something about younger people that have to hang on absolutely everything that's new. Think about the music that you like. If you were going out, just riding down the road by yourself, and you're just going to put on some music, my guess is that you're going to put on music from the time when you were somewhere between 14 and 18 years old. How many, how many of you have my ride on? Because that's when we develop what we like in music. So Phyllis and I go out for a Friday night, we listen to the 70s music. I know that was 100 years ago, but that's, that's what we listened to when we were dating. So if we're going out on our date night, we listen to our date music. Isn't it funny that here we are, 63 years old. I'm not quite 63. I'm still 62 for another month, and I'm holding on to that as tight as I can. Isn't it interesting that here... 40 years later, I'm still listening to the music I listened to when I was 15. Now, I see this in church, too. I cannot tell you how many people have come up to me at every church we go to. I don't like that old new music. You know what we like? What we grew up on. But you know what? I found out if God's got something brand new, I want it. If God's speaking to his church today through praise and worship music, hey, I still like the hymns, but I absolutely love music that allows me to lift my hands and begin to praise him and worship him in a, in a different way. And, and what I have learned is that, that God's not stuck in a rut, even though he never changes, his methods change. And, and his word never changes, the message never changes, but the ways of getting it out, we've got Facebook, we've got all kinds of uh, stuff. I was listening to Perry Stone earlier today, and I was thinking about all the, the years uh, over the, the past 40, 50, 60 years, how that everybody used to go around and do big crusades in tents. And then whenever the days of the tents kind of went away, everybody went around and did big crusades in Coliseum or the, the ball, ballparks or whatever. And then whenever that all began to go away, now everybody's reaching more people now than they did back then without ever leaving their office or without ever leaving their church because it can go out through Facebook and go around to the whole world. God will use whatever methods there are and, and whatever he begins to, to work with his church and doing a new thing. I, I think that hymns had their place, and I think they still have their place today, but praise and worship music, every church that I know of that's growing by leaps and bounds has a dynamic praise and worship going on so that whenever the people come in, they can begin to lift their hands and praise God, and it's a different thing. It's what God's doing now. 
And I don't want to ever be stuck and say, God, I can't do that because that's not what I listened to when I was 15. I want to be able to say, God, constantly change me. Constantly help me to renew my mind. Constantly help me to reach, not just for the, everything that's new in the world. Hey, I like shiny things just like y'all do. I like some new stuff, but I want the things that God's doing. I want to be right there where he is every single minute. And if it means that I have to change, Lord, put me on that potter's wheel. Lord, change me. Lord, mold me. Take those impurities out of me. Lord, I may not like the process. It might not be any fun. It might not be what I had planned, whatever I begin to pray that prayer. But God, have your way in me. Amen. Let's look at a couple situations. You have a young Christian trying to do right build up their faith and confidence in God, trying to, trying to go to church and do all the right things. But they're still hanging out with all the people that they hung out with and partied with. That's probably not going to be a successful situation. It's going to be very, very difficult for them to keep all the friends that they had before and become what God wants them to be. Why? Because it requires a whole lot more of you than just a little bit of commitment. Well, you mean they couldn't just turn around and witness to them and, and cause them all to come into the church if they could. But I've seen far, far too many times when that crowd pulled them right back out of church. So being set free means that there has to be some separation. Let's, let's do an extreme example. Somebody's on drugs. But they're praying every day, God set me free from the drugs. They live on a street where their drug dealer lives at the other end of the block. And all their friends hang out at their house all week doing drugs how likely is it that they're going to be able to quit in that situation? Not very. God would literally have to do a miracle to cause that to happen. Not, not that he couldn't do that, but I'm talking about when we pray for something, some change has to happen. When we begin to pray, God set me free from this situation, we have to be ready or at least willing for God to take us where he wants us to go. Now, this one has happened to me. Now, you're going to think I'm nitpicking whenever I get on this one. This one's happened to me. I'd be praying, Lord, I want to be everything you want me to be. Lord, take me, mold me, shape me, make me everything that you want me to be. But the people I was hanging out with were the kind of people that go to church about once a month, whether they need it or not. And they say things like, I don't know why you have to go to that church every time the doors are open. You're going to be so heavenly minded, you won't even be any earthly good. Have you ever met anybody so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good? I don't think I have. I've, I've met some people that thought they knew it all and things like that, but I'm talking about truly somebody that's been in the presence of Almighty God to the point that the anointing was on them and they were just saturated by it. I want to tell you, I, I, don't, I don't care what anybody thinks about that person. I want to hang out with them. That's, that's somebody I want to be around. Somebody that's like Moses when he came down off the mountain, they got a glow about them. That, that's somebody I can get, get used to knowing. That's somebody that I should be wanting to be. That's somebody that I should be praying every day. God, let me be like Moses. Let me stay in your presence. God, let me have such a hunger for you that the people that don't even want to be around me, Lord, will just, just go away. And I found out something. I found out even as a Christian, sometimes you have to separate your people, uh, separate yourself from people that are not going to be like-minded. People that are going to drag you down. Pastor Henry from Jamaica, y'all met him last year. He's finally out of the hospital. He got over COVID and he's back home. And, and so thank you for your prayers. He told me one day, he said, in Jamaica, we have crab theology. 
I said, you got to tell me what crab theology is. He said, in Jamaica, you catch a dozen crab, you put them in a bucket. They're all content to be in the bucket. And they might be in a bucket for a while and all of them just crawling around in the bucket. But then one of them looks up. And he decides he can reach the top. And he reaches the top and he begins to pull himself up. And all the other crabs grab hold of him and pull him back down. I thought, I know those people. There's times when I've been praying, seeking God and reaching for the top and saying, God, I, I, I don't even want to be normal. I want to be whatever you want me to be. There was always somebody around to reach around. And I want to tell you, if you're surrounded by those people that always want to put you down or always want to pull you down or always want to say something bad to you, burst your bubble just when you're on top, sometimes you have to remove yourself from some of your friends. Why? Because I want to be everything God wants me to be. One of these days, I'm going to get to stand before the throne. And I'm going to be listening with everything that's in me for those words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I can promise you the last thing on my mind is going to be what you think of me. The last thing on my mind is whether you think I'm a religious nut. I want to, I, I, it don't even matter. E even, even on this earth today, right now, I want to do absolutely every single thing I can for God and do it to the best of my ability. Why? Because it makes a difference in the kingdom. It really makes a difference in the kingdom. Well, you know, it's just little old me and I don't do much. You never know. Some of the things, the night that I was called to preach, the preacher preached about being a preacher. That's a really unusual sermon. And God called me to preach that night and I didn't even know what it was that, that, that I was supposed to do. All I knew was God dropped something in my heart and I was never the same from that day forward. I was supposed to do something for God. That's all I knew. And it was so settled and so rooted and so permanently placed in my heart that whenever they gave the altar call, other people went to the altar. I just stayed in my seat right where I was. I didn't feel the need to go to the altar. I didn't feel the need to pray. God had already done what he was going to do and placed this thing in my heart. And it was a few years later down the road that I was at a someplace in Nashville, and that preacher that had preached that night was there, and I went up and told him, I said, Brother Kelly, do you remember when you were in Livingston at, at Allen's Assembly of God Church? And he said, I do remember that. I said, you probably don't remember that I sat on the back row back there. He said, well, I don't remember that. I said, do you remember preaching about being a preacher? He said, oh, yeah, I remember that. I said, God called me to preach that night. He began to weep. Just the act of walking up and telling him that touched his heart and changed his life. Just the act of him preaching that message that night. Everybody that I have ever preached to, whether it's here, Jamaica, wherever it is, every, every place that we've ever sung, all of that. Because he was obedient that night and he preached what God had put in his heart. Whenever you do what God has put in your heart, it will make a difference to somebody. Why? Because if it wasn't going to make a difference to anybody, God wouldn't have put it in your heart. So Israel prayed about being in bondage and they came out of the frying pan into the fire. God set them free 
They didn't have the, the, the guards whipping them every day and the taskmasters driving them every day and making them work harder. They didn't have any of that, but they had change in their life and God delivered them from Egypt and brought them through the Red Sea and brought them out into the desert. I wonder how many times as they were on that little trip to get across the Red Sea out in the desert that they saw, this ain't what I wanted. This, this isn't what I signed up for. Are we really going to have to live in the desert? Now, really interesting thing about their situation in the desert, Sister Peggy, you may know, is it nine days or 11 days? It's one of those that if they took the most direct route to get from Egypt to the promised land that God had them, had it planned for them to go, if they had taken the most direct route, they could have been there in like nine days. Hey, that'd be pretty good. I get out of here. I don't have to be a slave anymore. I get to cruise across the desert in nine days. I'm going to enter into this promised land where everything's flowing with milk and honey. Sign me up for that. That sounds pretty good. Sounds like a nice thing. But the thing that they don't realize and the thing that you and I don't realize is that some of the things that God has to teach us takes time. Well, why don't God just save me and empower me and put everything inside me and just let me run? What kind of church would it be if God just poured everything into you on day one and put you up pastor in the church on day two? That'd be a fun church to attend, wouldn't it? What if God just called you on day one and put you out preaching on day two? There's some things you have to learn. When God called me to preach, it was three years between that night that he put that in my heart and the time that I stepped to the pulpit for my very first time. Three years. Somebody said, oh, you was just running from God. And I had to say, no, it's more the other way around. I was running toward God. God had to change a whole lot of things inside me. God had to change a whole lot of my way of thinking. How many knows when we grow up and we're in a lot of different churches and we hear a lot of different teaching by a lot of different people, we wind up with some stinking thinking. And God had to take me to the Word and I found out something. I found out that whatever it says in the Word really doesn't matter what anybody else has to think about it. This is always right. And so I found out that a whole lot of the things that I thought I knew wasn't right. My next door neighbor, when I was a kid, used to quote from the scripture, Bible plainly says, every tub will sit on its own bottom. Don't say that. How many has ever heard the Bible plainly says, this too shall pass? You don't say that. That's from a book by, by an author named Og Mandingo called The Greatest Salesman in the World. It's in that book. But it's not in this book. There's so much that God has to get us ready for. And the thing that I, I, when I watch a church grow and I look around and I see the church growing and the people growing and the people's desire to do something for God growing, I look around at this church right now and I, I, I know God's getting us ready. How do you think that we can have people come off the streets and get saved if we're not ready to handle them? If we're not ready to teach them, if we're not ready to help, help them grow? How, how about all these kids? How many was here Sunday and saw that whole passel of kids that we had? There was 90 people here Sunday. Wow. I was so excited. But what if there's nobody in place to handle those people? What if there's nobody in place to teach those people? What if there's nobody in place to teach those children? God is growing us. Right now, as a church, why? Because he needs people to be ready to step out and work and do things. And he's growing our hearts right now and changing things right now and pushing us through those screens right now and getting some of those little rocks out of us and doing all kinds of stuff. Why? Because he wants to use us. Well, I thought my job was to sit on the pew. I have never found in this book where your job is to sit on the pew. What I have found in this book is this. And whatsoever you do, <laughs> it's just assumed you're going to be doing something, right? 
Not even a question about that. Not if you decide to do something, no. It's whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Well, I guess I can put $10 in that offering plate. Here it comes. That ain't the way to do it. As unto the Lord. Well, wait a minute. That changes things. If I'm not putting this in here because the preacher's watching, if I'm not putting this in here because the guy beside me gave $5 and I want to give 10 so he can see it, I've had people tell me, I used to go to that church. They didn't treat me like I thought they should. I put hundreds and hundreds of dollars in that offering. This is a heart thing. Y'all know that, don't you? This is a relationship thing with God. Y'all know that. And if you love the Lord with all your heart, you don't have a problem giving to him. And it's not about what the person beside you does. It's not about what the person behind you does or in front of you does. It's do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Interesting. Now, out of the frying pan into the fire, they left Egypt... They left all that bad stuff behind, and God took them the long way through the desert. Why the long way? Some of y'all know why the long way. How many can look back at places in your life and think, I wouldn't be who I am now if I hadn't gone through those places? How many can look back at places in your life and say, I know that I know that I know that I know God will never leave me or never forsake me because if he was going to, he would have then. You, once you've been through it and you know what you know, I can't come and tell you that God's not going to bless you. Right? I can't come and tell you things aren't going to be as good as you think they are. I can't do that. Why? Because God's already proven himself to you. God's already proven that he's not going to leave you or forsake you. He's already proven that he's going to bless you. They complained about everything. Listen to this, Numbers chapter 11, verse 5. We remember the fish. Now, they're sitting out the desert having a pity party. And I know nobody in here has ever had a pity party. That's when people go to them other churches. Nobody around here would ever do something like that. You would not ever sit out in the desert around a campfire and whine and say, I remember the fish. Boy, they were good. It's funny, when we look back and remember stuff, we don't remember the bad times. I remember all the friends I used to have. You remember the hangovers on Monday morning? I, 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 remember, I, I remember how how much fun it was. You remember how broke you were? Oh, I just remember that old car I used to drive. I, I am guilty of this. I had a 66 Le Mans, and every time I see a, 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 a car that looks anything at all like it, I wish I had it back. But if the truth be told, that car was on its last legs. Oh, it looked good. I put some wheels on it. I painted it. But I forget about the part where the rust started showing back through under that new paint after about six months. That's the way we are. We, we look back and we just remember the shiny part. But we don't remember the part that, that, that wasn't so good. And that's what they're doing here. Whenever we look back, there's parts of, of your old life, maybe before you even got saved, that were a whole lot of fun. But I want to tell you, nothing compares with the peace and the joy and, and what God puts in our heart and all the blessings that he still has in store for us. We remember the fish, the cucumbers, and the melons, the leeks and the onions. They had a thing about leeks and onions. I'm not a fan of onions. Slice up a big onion and just put it under my nose and I go. I don't mind if you fry them up and caramelize them and all that. that that's, that's a different thing. But they had a thing about leeks and onions. They were always remembering the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But they had manna 
falling freely from heaven every single day. Oh, Lord, we just, we're, we're tired of this manna. They actually did that. Talk about looking a gift horse in the mouth. They looked at God and said, God, we know you're providing this manna, but we hate it. You know if you'd have been God, you'd have smacked them. Just pop. God just started letting it rain quail every day. Every day, a big, big cloud of quail would just come across the desert and just fall down on the ground and start flapping right, right where they were. I don't know what manna was, but I think it had to be angel food cake. I mean, whatever it was, it was directly from heaven and, and was some type of bread that sustained them and gave them everything that they, that they wanted. But in addition to that, God gave them quail. But even though there was food and water and divine protection and shelter and, and a, a pillar of fire by night to keep them warm and a, a pillar of cloud by day to keep them cool, I mean, they had central heat and air out in the desert and complain constantly. So here they are. They live in the desert. They quickly forgot how bad things were before. They're constantly moving. They're living in tents instead of houses like they once did. They're unsettled. I don't like that feeling of being unsettled. You? I kind of like to know a little bit about what my plans are for tomorrow. And they really didn't know that. They'd get up in the morning and God say, okay, let's go. And that had to be hard, living out in the desert, completely different than anything you'd ever known before. But isn't that kind of like being a Christian? Completely different from anything you ever knew in your past. You've given God 100% of your heart. And he says, Come on, I want to teach you something. And you start unlearning all that stuff that you used to think you knew. And then he comes along and drops something in your heart. I want you to be a preacher. I want you to be a prayer warrior. I want you to work in the church. I want you to knock on doors and witness to people. But Lord, what if they slam a door in my face? Uh, they will slam a door in your face. And pick on Brother Jason over here for a minute. What if somebody comes driving through out there and gives me an ugly look? Somebody might. They might come along and say, well, I thought this was going to be bigger than this. And you can go, Pfft. no. God blesses the effort because he's put it in your heart. I, I look at all the work that went on here, and, and Phyllis was instrumental in it, and Brother Jason, and I'm terrible at forgetting names when I should be able to call it. Treva. It's not that I didn't know it. I just get a premature senior moment every once in a while. All the work that went into it, and then I look at what's out there. Y'all know them boards just cut themselves and jumped up there and nails went in them and no, nobody really worked hard for that. Do you think he'd do that if God didn't put it in his heart? What would make somebody go out in the wintertime in the cold and work that hard? Because God's already dropped something in his heart. That would have been a whole lot harder for somebody that God didn't drop it in their heart and we just said, hey, Brother Wayne, you've got to go out and do this. That'd be a chore. But if God puts it in your heart, I used to think back when I was a kid, my mom told me, you're going to be a preacher. And I thought, that's the worst thing I could ever imagine in my life would be being a preacher. I can tell you, when I get up here and the anointing begins to flow, there is no place else that I'd rather be. And if I don't watch the clock, I go till midnight. Have people falling out the windows like Paul did. Changing, learning, and then we start making excuses. Lord, I'm feeling kind of unsettled. I'm feeling down to this desert experience. Lord, maybe when I get all my ducks in a row, Lord, then I'll begin to do something for you. Anybody ever felt like that? When I learned to play this guitar just a little better, Lord, 
Phyllis had started learning how to play the piano and she could play Amazing Grace. Not very well. You ever listen to somebody who's been playing the piano for about two weeks? And, and they can kind of chop their way through it and they hit about as many wrong chords as they do right chords. And she had just started playing the piano. Wonder why. Wonder why it was just all of a sudden in her heart to start learning how to play the piano. Wonder why she had just started practicing two weeks before our piano player quit and left the church. When God begins to put something in your heart, don't question it. Just begin to enjoy what God's doing in you. Why? Because he's growing you. He's getting you ready for something. Now, we're going to finish up right here. Did I mention that uh, God's not one bit embarrassed to uh, inconvenience you? So right in the middle of your desert, right in the middle of your complaining, turn to Exodus chapter 35, and you don't have to woo this time. Unless you really want to. <laughs> You've got a half a woo. Exodus chapter 35, verse 4, say amen when you get there. Right in the middle of the desert, right in the middle of their complaining, right in the middle of them trying to get it all together, God says this, tells Moses, and then Moses tells the people. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded. He didn't ask. He didn't say, Pretty please. God will look at you sometimes and just say, this is what I want in your life. And now it's your choice and your decision. And he does that here with the people. This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, take ye from among you an offering to the Lord. Can you imagine some of the things that was said? Does he not know we're homeless? Does he not know we live in a desert? Does he not know we left all of our houses behind and we're out here running around and we're, all the complaints, can you imagine all the stuff that might have been said? But then God says this. Whosoever is of a willing heart. Well, I'm just going to come to church. I'm going to sit on the pew. I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to do anything, but I'm going to make sure I'm there so I can go to heaven. That's going to be a rough ride. That is not the way to have fun in church. That is not the way to have a great relationship with God. That's not the way to have his presence and his, his power and his joy in your life. To just sit by and say, I don't have a willing heart. I'm only here because I don't want to die and go to hell. That's not the person that God's going to ever use. How many in here just... Just be honest. How many says, God, I want you to use me? Everybody in this place, we, we want to grow and we want to be everything that God wants us to be. This is one of my favorite, I'll hit it here in just a minute, one of my favorite things in the Bible. Right out in the middle of the desert, God didn't do one of those offerings like I've heard people, preachers get up and say, now folks, we're going to take up an offering here in a minute. We hear it all the time, Phyllis and I. We'll go to churches, and, and I don't mean nothing at all bad by this, but we'll go to churches, and, and sometimes preachers will get up and do like this. They'll, they'll get up and say, now folks, I, I know this church has been in a building program. I know you've already given. I, I, I know that you, they apologize to the crowd before they ever take up the offering. I know that you ain't got nothing left, but if you can give just a little bit to help these singers get some gas to get back home. I've heard it a thousand times. I've heard it all my life because mom and dad were singers and I heard it back then. Nothing's changed. Moses didn't apologize. Listen to this. They're out in the middle of the desert and he says, take an offering unto the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it an offering to the Lord. Gold and silver and brass. God doesn't mind one bit reaching right down in the middle of all your problems and all your turmoil and all of your unsettled and saying, hey, 
Straighten up here a minute. I want to talk to you. I want you to give me an offering and don't bring me no, no junk. I want your absolute very best. Why should we give God second hand? Why should we give God good enough? Why, why should we give God, well, you know, that's good enough for who it's for? I don't think there's anybody, anything that we could give. I used to work on jobs and, and, and houses and stuff, and I'd hear that all the time. Somebody would be doing something, they'd say, well, I'm about finished with this. It's good enough for who it's for. Don't try that on God. God said, bring me gold and silver and brass. And this was in a day when blue and purple and scarlet was re reserved for kings and queens. The common people just wore common clothes, just whatever color they happened to be. If you had the, the, the dyes and all the stuff to, to, to change that and, and turn it into something fine, that wasn't for the common person. That was for royalty. So he says, bring me blue and purple and scarlet and my personal favorite, fine linen. Don't just bring me your linen. Keep that other stuff for yourself. Bring me your best. Now, men don't generally know this. Women do. I was shocked one day when I heard one of these ads on the radio or on television about these sheets and pillows that were made out of some kind of special fabric from, e from Egypt or somewhere, and I decided I was going to hop on the Internet and see how much that cost. And I hollered through the house, hey, Phyllis, did, did you know these people are wanting a thousand bucks a piece for sheets? She said, yeah. See, men don't know that stuff. We'll spend a thousand bucks on craftsmen, right? That impact range, we need that. that that's, that's good stuff. And yeah, it's a thousand bucks, but it's battery powered. That's... Don't be surprised right in the middle of the time that you're not expecting it for God to tap on your shoulder and say, remember when you prayed, God, take me and mold me and change me and make me what you want me to be. Give me your best. Give me your best. I was here Sunday morning. I was here all during the Christmas play rehearsals and stuff. And I love these kids. And you love these kids. These are your kids and your grandkids and they're kids. And what do kids do? They run and play and they squeal and they scream and they make all kinds of little noises and you get about a dozen of them together and they're all running back and forth and they're just making that noise, you know, they're doing that thing. Because that's what they do. And I was here Sunday morning when those very same kids came down those steps dressed in all of those costumes and they came down those steps like this. And they marched up here. And didn't they give it their best? There's a word that comes to mind. When you're going to do something for God. One word. I want to leave you with this word. Excellence. Everything you do for God. Yeah, but that offering plate's coming around. I've only got $5 in my pocket. Really wish I could give 100 How about telling God that? God, this is all I got. And I'm going to give it. And Lord, when you bless me with 100 I'm going to give that too. And when you bless me with a thousand, Lord, I'm going to have a big smile on my face one day when I can drop a thousand dollars. I'm going to have a big smile on my face one day when a missionary comes through here and I can write them a check for $10,000. Isn't that how we ought to be thinking? 
God, I'm going to be faithful in the little things. When I make $10, I'm going to tithe and put a dollar in the offering. And when I make $10,000, I'm not going to have a problem putting $1,000 in the offering. Why? Because God will take those little things, those times when you're in the middle of the desert, those times when you don't have a whole lot to give, if you'll simply do it with excellence. When he looks at your heart, he sees excellence. These kids didn't put money in the offering that I know of Sunday. But every single thing that they did, they did with excellence. There's our example. And whatsoever you do, this is Colossians 3.23, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men knowing that, the, that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Heads bowed and eyes closed, please. I think everybody here is a Christian. I think everybody here is probably serving the Lord with all your heart. But if there's anybody here that says, I'm not a Christian or I'm not as close to him as I want to be, or not as close to him as I should be, just slip your hand up and we'll pray together. Father, we thank you for this service tonight. Lord, I thank you for everybody that's come. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Lord, it has done this preacher good. I needed this word, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for my pastor. I thank you for these people, Lord, my brothers and sisters. God, I thank you for what I see you doing here, that you're preparing us, that you're preparing this church for what you have planned. God, I pray that you would just keep your hand upon us, continue to lead us and guide us. And God, help every single one of us, everything that we do, to do it unto you and to do it with excellence. In Jesus' name, amen. You're free to go.